Welcome to another episode of Simon Says, where facts come first. I'm your host, Jenny Simon. Today we have a lot of catching up to do. We have some updates from um, from last week's episode. So we'll get some of that first, at least most of it are updates. And then we would like to update you on another matter. So sit back, buckle your seatbelts. We take a quick break and come back to you. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Welcome back. Now, after last week's episode of Simon Says, when I came upset, there were a number of uh, snapshots, should I say, of the front page of a weekly uh, print media, it's online now, on my phone and my WhatsApp. And so most of you by now might have seen it, but I would like to share it with those of you who probably haven't seen it. And there is a clip of the front page of the new today. As you see on your screen, and it's headlined, multi-million dollar lawsuit in the making from family of murdered American couple. And I'm quoting here. According to the uh, article, James Bristol Casey said he was approached by the family members after the Grenada incident took place. The retainer's fee to secure his, the services of Bristol came against the backdrop of the first press conference held on Tuesday, the 13th March, by Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell. And as we all know by now, that was 24 days later, 24 days after the incident of the three escapees. At last week's episode, I mentioned to the Prime Minister that he would be for his high-handed behavior towards the whole incident. What I should have said was we would pay. We, meaning the government and people of Grenada, would pay. No money is going to come from the pocket of the Prime Minister. Any money whether it's for lawyer fees or losing the case, whatever it is, if there is there, there's a case, it could also be settled out of court, um, would come from the coffers of the government and people of Grenada. The prime minister in his press conference spoke to you and I and the rest of the world, including, of course, the families of Ralph, Henry and Kathy Brander, the victims of the incident. He said there were four locking cells. And no, when I, I <laughs> you're listening to that and you're saying, okay, wow, is that right? Because we were never told that before by Ernie and Burke. But of course, I guess they had to wait for the prime minister to speak. Okay, so he said there, there were four locking cells with proper locking merchandise, right? Um, mechanism, I'm sorry, proper locking mechanism. However, the man was placed in a corridor, I guess, in front of the cell with a metal gate that probably would keep them from going out into the rest of the station. A couple of days before the escape, and these are all things the Prime Minister told us in the press conference. A couple of days before the escape, they were warned that the young criminals were high risk and high and flight risk, high risk and flight risk. 
and that um, they, I guess being in the prime minister, the hierarchies, the, the RGPF, the commissioner and his assistant was satisfied that if proper protocol was followed, the men should not have escaped custody. So right there, he told us that proper protocol was not used. He further said, and uh, I'll let you hear him as he said for himself. The investigation therefore has concluded uh, that there was a failure to heed the crucial alerts, a failure to follow the standard operating procedures. Uh, there was clear supervisory negligence and uh, improper shift handovers, and that those factors contributed to the opportunity being presented to the prisoners to escape. So in summary, it is accepted by the police that human error, primarily in the form of negligence, played a pivotal role in the escape of the officers. So I didn't say it. Simon says it didn't say it. The Prime Minister of Grenada, who is the Minister of National Security, in charge of the security for Grenada, told us, told the world, told the family members that primarily negligence caused the escape of the three prisoners who caused the death, the disappearance of their parents, of their loved ones. Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell disclosed that the report concerning the investigation done by Assistant Superintendent A.S.P. Ryan Hall was handed in as a result. Disciplinary charges were laid against the officers on duty at the time of the breakout. Let's hear the charges as they were laid. So what has been done as a result of the findings of the investigation? Uh, pertaining to the escape of the three prisoners. The Commission of Police and his team has already embarked on a number of initiatives. And I will start first with disciplinary action. Disciplinary action has been taken against, so far, four police officers who were charged this morning. Constable 224 Shah George, Constable 520 Baptiste, Corporal 624 Edwards and Detective Sergeant Lewis. They have been charged uh, with various offenses uh, under the Police Act, ranging from making a false statement, permitting the escape of a prisoner, and breaches of standing orders in various counts. These officers, however, are also entitled to due process and to have their fair day at the disciplinary hearing. They're entitled to due process, but he reading out all of their names. Whenever there is a crime committed and someone is picked up by the police for questioning, that's what we told. We told someone is assisting the police with the investigation. We never told, we, they, they never tell us who the name of that person, that individual is. But there we are with the Prime Minister telling us, or reading out the names of all the police officers and their charges. Maybe he can do so because he's the Prime Minister and the, the Minister for um, Security. After all this, with the families listening, the question was asked by a media personnel, were the officers charged 
suspended? Will they um are they being paid salaries, half salary, no salary? You know that that that, that question. And the answer was yes. I'll just like to know if the officers that are being charged, if they're on if they're going to be suspended and if it's going to be half paid, half pay, no pay at all, full pay. Uh, the answer to that is no. They would continue on duty through the disciplinary process. So you just charge them for negligence that caused them to escape, that caused them to hijack two tourists, two sailors, that caused them who are still missing and are suspected murdered raped and murdered and thrown overboard. And they're still on duty, they're still being paid, and they would remain on duty. Full stop. So the rest is history. The rest is history. Multi-million dollar lawsuit on, or in the making rather, from the family of the murdered American couple. Surprise, surprise. Are you surprised? I'm not. If you just listened to the press conference, you knew, and you should have known that was coming. And if you're a lawyer, you know, if you're a lawyer, you should know that it was going to come as well. Wednesday, the 21st February, the day the yacht was found in St. Vincent Ramsack, was Kathy Brandel's 71st birthday. Just last year, she became a first time grandmother. And, and, and I, I feel it because I'm a first time grandmother. I became a first time grandmother last year as well. And I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm, it it's such a pleasure, you know? And so it, it, it touched me. When, when I got that bit of information. The couple was married for 26 years, retired, and 10 years ago, sold their home, their house, bought the yacht, named it Simplicity, and set sail. This was their first time in this neck of the woods. Now, after the prime minister's obviously calculated press conference that touched the raw nerves of some of us, at, at least those of us who have nerves. The NBC party singing to the choir without a release to pick up their leader. Caption, cometh the hour, cometh the man. Cometh the hour, cometh the man. We can be honest. Our beautiful island was rocked and the senseless acts of violence had us really. But come at the hour, come at the man. As the prime minister said, we were rightly outraged and ashamed of what happened. However, our level-headed prime minister did not join the outrage. Instead, he got to work and took command of the details. Today is March 13, and over 40 years ago, our nation had another level-headed leader who moved to stead nerves, to restore hope, education, and prosperity to our beautiful nation break the cycle of colonial mindset and expectation. Not sure the relevance and what this has to do with it. However, that's the idol. Let's move on. Our prime minister, in full command of the fact, broke the cycle of generation of Brango and instead established trust. We still waiting for that. He allowed fairs and shown a light on inherited structural and societal challenges. That as a nation, 
we can no longer simply talk about dismissed, but the crime, but the time has come to act. Deacon Mitchell, Deacon Mitchell's honesty and openness in, in a breath of fresh air, no mixing of wood. His talk, the listen, I'm reading this as is it. I'm not correcting anything here. He took the time to learn about the life of the young man arrested for firearm possession and displayed empathy with his plight. The young man has to account for his actions. However, our prime minister acknowledged the impacting societal factors for the misguided decision the young man made. Grenada, we can and must do better with our young people. I agree wholeheartedly. As the Minister of National Security, it cannot be easy to publicly discipline officers within your line ministry who put their lives on the line to keep us safe. Grenadians, we Grenadians, have we ever seen this level of accountability and transparency in any government, including the revolution that we loved? This is a new era for our nation, a new era for our governance, and a new era for our people. Indeed it is, but not what you're thinking. <laughs> we have come to expect to be disappointed. We have come to expect incompetence. The press conference dealing with very difficult issues made us proud again. I ain't going to say nothing there. As a small nation, events that would not have, would not even be reported in larger countries are headline news. And that is because it's a small country and everybody know everybody. In larger countries, when Wisconsin do something, New York don't know about it or Florida. That's why it is, it is like that. But they bring their local news. If you listen to, if you're in Miami by chance and you listen to Florida news, you would be amazed. All you hear about is the murders, the crimes. That's it. So don't come with that crap with us. Don't, don't come with that. Okay. These events represent national crisis for us and it's reassuring to know we had the right leader with a steady hand to nav navigate us through difficult times. We are truly blessed to have Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell leading us at this time. P.T. Martinique, Karaku and Grenada Please join us in a salute to our commander in chief, our reassurer in difficult times, our steady hand, our leader who does not act on emotions, but on the facts. We salute you, Prime Minister, Honorable Deacon Mitchell, sincerely, the National Democratic Congress. Now, obviously, his words didn't speak for himself, for itself, or else there would be no need for that cover story. A cover story that spoke on truth. <laughs> I mean, that's the mantra of the NBC, on truth, right? But they saw the need because I guess people were grumbling and fumbling behind. We did not get any reassurance. I don't know what they're talking about there. We did not get anything to make us have more trust in the administration. And I think they knew it. That's why they came out with the cover story. But the cover story made it worse and drew more attention to the press conference and what he said at the press and didn't say at the, the press conference. There was no compassion. There was no reassurance. Well, there was no assurance to start with. He never assured us 
that everything was going to be okay, much less to come and reassure. I have a question for the Coast Guard and the hierarchy of the RGPM. My, my, my good friend, my good Sesame, Sesame Street friends. Was an emergency locator transmitter, an ELT, sent off the evening of Sunday the 18th of February from the yacht Simplicity? It's a question. If it was, was that picked up by the Coast Guard? If no, why not? Word reaching me said there was an ELT allegedly sent out and received otherwise. And if yes, why wasn't the emergency locator transmitter, ELT, responded to by our Coast Guard? All questions. Another updating story. On Monday, the 18th, March 2024, the Housing Authority of Grenada put out a release. Happy, hey, hey. The, uh, the flyer announcing the beginning of the distribution of the low income houses in current St. David's. If you look on your screen, there you'd see the flyer. The after St. David's that would follow by the Villa St. Patrick, Dumfries Caracou, Boston Zoo, St. George, and Diamond St. Mark in that order, they would be distributed. That was backed up by a video with instructions to follow. Let's hear that video. We are excited to unveil the seamless process for acquiring your dream unit. Here's what you need to know. Inspection and acceptance of unit, signing of sale agreement, preparation of conveyance by legal team, finalization of transaction between financial institutions, Housing Authority of Grenada and legal team. Handover of keys to homeowner. Important dates to keep in mind. Monday, 18th March, 2024, financial institutions will be notified of the availability of the legal documentation for the units. Units will be handed over in the following order. Corinth, St. David, the Villa, St. Patrick, Dumfries, Cariacou, Bouchejou, St. George, and Diamond in St. Mark. Tuesday, 19th March to Friday, 22nd March, 2024, between the hours of 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., the following will take place. Assigned units will be available for inspection for pre-approved clients. Appointment for hearing required. Clients can set up an appointment by contacting Housing Authority of Grenada's main office. Inspections will be conducted in the presence of Housing Authority of Grenada officials. Inspection forms to be signed off on by clients and Housing Authority of Grenada officials. All queries by a client must be noted on the form. Monday 25th March to Thursday 28th March 2024 between the hours of 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The inspection of units will be opened to other shortlisted applicants. Appointment for viewing required. Following the inspection and acceptance of the unit, the client through appointment will be contacted to sign the sale agreement at Housing Authority of Grenada's main office. Inspections of units at the other locations will commence on the following dates. The Villa St. Patrick, 2nd April 2024 and onwards, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. weekdays. Dumfries Cariacou, 2nd April 2024 and onwards, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. weekdays. Bouchejou St. George, 15th April 2024 and onwards, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. weekdays. Diamond St. Mark, 29th April 2024 and onwards, 
9 a.m. to 6 p.m. weekdays. Please note that the inspection process along with processing of sale agreements will run continuously from Tuesday, 18th March, 2024. As we embark on this journey of home ownership, the Government of Grenada through the Housing Authority of Grenada congratulates you and remains committed to providing an exceptional experience throughout the transition to home ownership. Seamless process, Stacey. Does that sound seamless to you? Some of these persons will not receive a key in their hand for another month and it could be more. Seamless, Stacey. People purchasing million dollars of property do not have to go through such a process to get their home, to get the key to their home. Seamless process. Where, where is nature building? Nature builders didn't see that. That's too much bureaucracy. <laughs> My friends of nation building, I love you guys. Congratulations to those of you who have received your keys or are in the process of doing so because some of you ain't getting that key anytime soon. We would like to know though, we would hope that the board, the members of the board will come back to us and let us know how many people have received keys or the loans so that they can receive their keys and that sort of thing and how they, they, they got through, you know, and, and how they're doing. We, we, we await a press conference from the Housing Authority. Project 500. We did spoke about the 500 houses. So we have another update for you. Things happening, things working out, you know. Project 500. Over the weekend, this little house showed up in social media, and that's the blue house. And it was put up by A.J. Williams, Minister for MIT. As you look on the screen, you see this cute little blue house with a question, and it reads, imagine you have available land and Project 500 can build this affordable home, 22 by 16, where you pay back, where your payback is 300 per month. Would you be interested? And I think the last thing I saw, like, one point something people liked it, right? Uh, just a couple was interested. Then he showed Prime Minister Mitchell while he was in Guyana for the CARICOM Heads con uh, uh, Conference, meeting and discussing with housing representative of Guyana Housing Authority. If you look there, he posed up nicely in a meeting there. Further to that, the Prime Minister, sorry, further to that, the Minister, A.J. Williams, posted again in social media samples of designs of different houses again, not just a little blue one. The little blue one, I guess, is for the poor and the vulnerable, who I don't think they make a $300 payment, but anyways, the rest you can see is not in the poor and vulnerable bracket. Um, so he posted these houses and it's captioned Project 500 on the way, stay tuned. See the designs, they're lovely designs. We've been staying tuned for a long, long time, which is almost two years, three months short of two years, we've been staying tuned. Or oh, the other phrase coming soon. Like soon has a different meaning for this administration. This is the same guy that promised, that was promised two million US dollars to build a coconut factory. Coming soon since August the 13th, 2023. Coming soon, a plant aided and adding value to coconut. 
That was the captain. There we have him posing with the Indians. He then went to India and he told us that the Indians were going to visit when he came back, that they were going to visit in September of 2023. We saw and heard nothing of the Indians to date. According to Andy Williams, 5,000 coconut plants was already on the way from Mexico and Brazil. I'm not sure if 5,000 was coming from Mexico and 5,000 from Brazil, or a total of 5,000 was coming from Mexico and Brazil. But I read it as he had posted it. This is quotations here. He also said that these coconuts take four years to bear fruit. Initially, I know from time, I guess, with all, you know, the, the, the different improvements and all these things that can happen, I don't know. But I know that coconut takes at least between 10 and 15 years to bear. But Mr. Um, MIT's coconut will take four years to bear. The coconut probably will bear on the way here because they look like it's getting here anytime soon. With the Ministry of Implementation involved, he said, we will surely increase the number. It's a great time to be a farmer, he said. He then went on to New York for a town hall meeting, October 8th, 2023. And let's hear what he had to say in New York. One of our plan is to bring back agro-processing in Grenada. <laughs> And I am not just, just, just saying it. Anyone could say anything, but you need to back it up. So when I went to India two months ago, I met with the Indian government, and the, and the pledge to give Grenada one million US dollars in equipment, any equipment we want, to start our factories. <clears throat> Now, we have better news. When I go back to Grenada, the, the delegation will be visiting Grenada, and they said, Andy, that one million is now two million. Ooh. Andy, that one million is now two million. I don't know of any government, any administration who do business like that. It has to be some kind of popoy flute or uh, cuckoo thing down below the house. Anyway, they called him. They said, Andy, that million is now two million. US dollars, we're talking about. Eh? US dollars. And that was early October. He said when he came back, they would be coming to Grenada. That's the second time the Indians come in. Is either Andy and come back yet? But that was another lie, right? But it's coming soon. It's coming soon. The word soon is defined by Cambridge Dictionary in or within a short time, before long, quickly. They give an example. She'll be there soon. This is the same Andy Williams, whom together with Claudette Joseph, our attorney general and minister of legal affairs and labor and consumer affairs. But the, the important thing to note here, the minister of legal affairs and our attorney general hosted a meeting at the Radisson on Friday the 16th June, 2023, with representatives from both the public and private sector to view and discuss proposed plans for the development of the Lagoon Road and the Port Highway. Presentations were delivered by Torian Primus and Tori Kelis, two second year students at TAM CC, who were concluding their six weeks internship 
at the ministry. The assignment was to propose designs for Port Highway and the Lagoon Road to be implemented under the Visible Transformation Project. We heard that a lot in the early, a, a year and some ago. We heard a lot about the Visible Transformation Project. We ain't hear nothing about that no more. Nice big name. You know, they, they love the big names. I see they changed the CBI project to uh, IMA, Investment Mitigation Agency. The debushing is best, B-E-S-T. The bathroom and toilet project is WASH. I think they changed the Ministry of Education to, to what the... Um, some, 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 something, I don't quite remember it right now. They're on the way to change the Imani name. There is the article of the meeting um, at the Radisson, big meeting. Now this is an audio, a voice note from one of the vendors on the port highway. So Kenel, so this is how it went. Andy Williams had a meeting with us. Remember we were there? Do you remember that meeting? Okay, that's the last meeting that we had where they actually sat down and they talked to us and they let us ask questions and they showed us a blueprint render of what the building would look like. And that's what we've been waiting for. And then we get a letter to say vacate in, 30, in 28 days. So it's like one side of the government is saying something and then somebody else changed their mind without telling us. They've been having meetings without us, not telling us what's going on, and then we get this letter. So my thing is that, okay, I don't mind moving, but like you said, they should have something where they're moving us to. You know, where is the plan that's going to uh, prepare us, uh, transition us into another location? Nobody's saying that. All they're telling us is get out. So what I was told is that this land is not government land. This is Port Authority's land, and the government don't have nothing to do with it. It's like you have your own land, and somebody's squatting on your land, and you're giving them notice to get off. And the government don't have nothing to do with it, which I understand that. The only thing is that if that happened, if you squatted on my land, I can't just kick you off. I just can't bull bulldoze your house down. you got to take me to court. And the same with us. If we're on, on squatting on land that's not the government land, then take us to court. You know, it's like something needs to be in place to put us somewhere. Do you know that this this shop, even though they call, they don't like Port Highway and nastiness or whatever, my shop is clean. And I have to suffer with everyone, you know. There's rats on here on the Port Highway. Everybody has them, not just me. Everybody's fighting them. All right. This shop pays for my lights, my water, and my rent. And it keeps me alive. When I have to shut this down, when I have to dismantle the shop, I have nowhere to go. I have, well, I would not have a job no more. I have no idea where my in income is gonna come from. So I will be unemployed. I will be unemployed in Grenada in 28 days. So, you know, this is very disheartening that nobody's thinking about us, you know? They keep saying, oh, the River Road, they, the same thing happened to them, and this is happening all over the island, but what plan is in place to make sure that we're not unemployed? I've been here for five years. This November will be five years. Next door, 17 years. Down the Blue Bubbles, I don't know how long. Uh, Brian, 25 years. There's some people who came in after me, but it's like, come on, y'all, they about to make us unemployed. And it's not, if you have a house and you're getting ready to evict some people, do you know the landlord has to give the people 90 days to move and they got to help them find a place to stay? But they're not even helping us find a place to stay. They're just saying, get out. We have to pay $50,000 if we don't get out that day. And then it's a thousand dollars a day if we're still here. So I don't know. I, I'm I, I'm torn between feelings. I'm like, I'll break this down, and I have I think I have somewhere I, I can put it um, to, as far as storage. But I don't have a place to lease to like rent a spot so I can repurpose the 
the wood and build another one. I would like to build again, but um, I don't have nowhere to rent. I don't, work, I don't have no land. I, you know, the government's not helping me find no place to stay. So I don't know. I don't know how they have a heart to do this. Yes, Andy had the meeting with us last year. So if, if the government's not involved and it's supposed to be separate, it's supposed to be a, the Port Authority's land, why is the government having a meeting with us and giving us all these hope when it's not theirs? So if they're not gonna intervene and help us, why did they give us this picture that they was gonna build this place, a food court, making us think that we have a place to go and have bathroom and stuff? Why did they do that to us? If that's not what the whole thing is about, because Andy's hot in his hands now, Andy don't wanna be a part of it. So I'm looking on the paper and it says it can be appealed. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna appeal it. On the screen, you noticed though, that was the enforcement letter received. Um, we heard the vendor, she didn't make up that story. Andy and Claudette brought them to a meeting at the Radisson last year, June, June 2023. Let's hear what um, Ellie had to say to them at that meeting. I want to tell you about uh, an initiative between MIT and your caretaker for the Tongue of St. George. And one of the initiatives one of the initiatives that we have embarked on is cleaning up the port highway, right? We have a plan in place, both of us, we sat down and we put together a plan where opposite the fan house, we can construct a building that can house the people who are vending right now on the side of the road, right? And it will be a two-story building and we can have people who sell food and so because right now they are selling food with no toilet facilities, no water, and that is dangerous. Right? So, and again, we are we admire them because they are not begging, they are trying to earn a living. So, so as a government, it is our duty to see what we can do to assist them. And so we we want to do a two-story building that can house them and we can free up the side of the road for parking. Right? <laughs> so DJ, and, and also, I don't know if she told her that she is looking to light up the canals. You told her that too? i just making sure that she tell you everything, right? So there he is, promising the people a place to go, food court and all. He said, jam without water and electricity, and so it's dangerous. That is dangerous. I totally agree with that. But he gave Superman a place without water electricity. We'll come to Superman in a minute. We'll come to Superman in a minute. You see, I've said it before and I'm saying it again. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. And I'm the first to, to admit that the Port Highway is an eyesore for the most part. An eyesore. But don't play footsie with people's livelihood. Have some compassion, right? You promise to prepare a place for them to continue their trade. Nine months now. And so they waited. Now, nine months ago, if you told them that they need to move, by now, they might have gotten a place on their own and be settled in it. But again, a lot of big promises. Yes, pie in the sky. And you cannot come through. You have not come through. Not one brick was laid in this complex, whatever you promised them, opposite the panels. Opposite the panels, as far as I remember, is the field. I'm a harper, so I know that opposite the panels is the field. I don't know where in the field you're going to put this project. Today, they're told they have to go and given 28 days, which was already counted, to leave. 
too many empty promises, bold faced promises fallen by the wayside. Look at Soup Master in a two by four with no water, no electricity, no place to sit, no toilet facilities given to him by you, the minister of MIT, who sat there and said, it is dangerous to run a place cooking food or selling food without water, and I agree totally. We have to look out for food poisoning. I have been a victim of food poisoning. Why? Serious one was very, very serious. As a matter of fact, the doctor said to me, you could have been killed. I spent five days at the general hospital. So I understand that. And it wasn't from by the side of the road. So it wasn't from by the side, it was from the restaurant. It wasn't from the side of the road. Hey. He was promised this lovely gazebo there after you demolish his old one that you're seeing there, which needed to be demolished. It's the truth is it looked like a rat nest. And you were promised this. In the words of Andy Williams, I want to thank Soup Master for buying into our vision for this area. A modern booth will be constructed to support this gentleman move his soup business forward. And then this is what you gave him. I couldn't find a photo of the final thing with the windows because all that's missing there was the, is the window and the doors, I think. That's why you gave it to him. Uh, that, that, that size, that no pain, nothing. Just like that. Just added windows and doors and stuff. This is what he got. This little art. Without, again, I'm going to say it, without running water, without electricity, without toilet facilities, bathroom facilities. Top the fantasy island politics. Top the fantasy island politics. If all you think that bad, sit tight. I'm about, I'm about to blow your mind. Mine was blown. Right now, I know mine. I know it was blown. <laughs> it was blown away. Now, I'd like to share a video with you. Not sure what to make of it, but it's out there. As a matter of fact, there are two of them. But in the interest of time, I'd like to share one of them with you. I'm hoping some of you can shed some light on this for me because right now I'm, I'm confused. If any one of you have seen it, I'm sure you are. But somebody somewhere might be able to shed some light on it for me. Let's see that video. From the heart of the Caribbean, we unveil a tapestry of development that showcases the Granada's commitment to progress and innovation. This video takes you on a journey through ambitious projects shaping the island's future. From modern infrastructure to sustainable initiatives driving economic growth. Join us as we uncover the 10 biggest upcoming, ongoing, and completed mega-projects in Granada. Welcome back to Just Know It 254. Before we continue, please subscribe to this channel, I promise you will have the best videos and I will make them so interesting for you to watch and learn, please subscribe. Number 10, Granada International Airport Expansion. Granada International Airport Expansion is a project to increase the airport's capacity at Point Salines. The airport's capacity will be increased from 500,000 to 1 million passengers per year as a result of the development. It will also have a new runway, terminal and parking garage. The expansion is expected to cost $150 million and will be finished in 2024. Granada International Airport expansion is planned to promote tourism by making it easier for visitors to fly to the island. The development is also projected to produce a lot of revenue for Granada's economy. Number 9, Granada National Stadium. The Granada National Stadium is a new stadium in St. George's that is presently under development. 
The stadium will hold up to 20,000 people and will be utilized for a range of events such as athletic events, concerts, and cultural festivals. The stadium is expected to cost $50 million and should be completed soon. The Granada National Stadium is projected to provide a significant boost to Granada's sports industry. The stadium, which will be able to accommodate large-scale events, will also be a key tourist destination. Number 8, Granada Multiplex Cinema. The Granada Multiplex Cinema is a new multiplex theater in Grand Anas that is currently under development. The theater will feature six screens and seating for up to 1,000 people. The cinema is expected to cost $20 million and should be completed soon. The Granada Multiplex Cinema is projected to provide a significant boost to Granada's entertainment industry. The theater, which will be able to screen the most recent films, will also be a key tourist destination which will increase government revenue. Number 7, Granada Technology Park. The Granada Technology Park is a new technology park that is currently under construction in True Blue Granada's Bay. The technology park, which is scheduled to open in late 2024, will house a variety of technological enterprises including software developers, IT consultants and data centers. The Granada Technology Park is being created by the Granada government in collaboration with a private developer. Granada is projected to benefit from the Technology Park in terms of job creation and investment. Number 6, Granada Port Authority Cruise Terminal. The Granada Port Authority Cruise Port is a new cruise port in Street Georgias that is currently under development. The terminal will have a capacity of 2,000 people and will include facilities such as a duty-free retail area, a food court and a beachfront boardwalk. The terminal is expected to cost $100 million and should be completed soon. The Granada Port Authority Cruise Terminal is intended to bring more cruise ships to Granada, boosting tourism. The port is also projected to produce cash for the Granada economy and create employment. Number 5, Granada Medical University. The Granada Medical University is a private medical school in Grand Ends, Granada. The institution will provide a number of medical degrees, including a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. A partnership of investors from Granada, the United States and the United Kingdom is developing the Granada Medical University. Granada expects the institution to have a big economic impact, producing jobs and strengthening the local economy. Number 4, Granada Golf Course. The Granada Golf Course is a new golf course currently being built at True Blue Bay, Granada. The golf course will be a championship course built by a famous golf course architect and is scheduled to be completed by 2025. The Granada Golf Course is projected to be a major tourist attraction and produce considerable revenue for Granada. The golf course will also help Granada gain recognition as a destination for players from all over the world. Number 3, Granada Botanical Gardens. The Granada Botanical Gardens is a new botanical garden in Grand Etang that is currently under construction. Plants and flowers from the Caribbean area such as orchids, palms and gingers will be included in the gardens. It will also include a butterfly garden and a medicinal plant garden as teaching exhibits. The gardens, which are slated to be finished in late 2024, will be a key tourist destination in Granada. Number 2 Granada Eco Village The Granada Eco Village is a new sustainable community currently being built near Grand Etang. The village will be built using ecologically friendly materials and will use renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power. A school, a health facility and a restaurant will be among the enterprises located in the community. The hamlet, which is set to be finished in 2024, will serve as an example for sustainable living. Number 1 Granada Aquarium The Granada Aquarium is a new aquarium currently being built in Grand Ends, Granada. The aquarium, which will display the aquatic life of the Caribbean Sea, is anticipated to be completed shortly. The Granada Aquarium will have a shark tank, a coral reef tank and a sea turtle tank among other exhibits. The aquarium is projected to be a driver of national progress and will generate jobs for the citizens of Granada.
Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Well, um, what 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 to start on this one? Most of these projects will be finished by 2024. Only one of them I had. As a matter of fact, one of them is supposed to finish in May 2024. And the other one in 2025. And a couple of them soon. The word soon. <laughs> the other, the other uh, video started off with a bridge looking like the Brooklyn Bridge in Sauter. Don't know if that's Windy Bridge from Thetez to Karakou, but that one, or if you saw that bridge, but that one is much longer. And, you know, as I said, in the interest of time, I can't show you both. Maybe one day I will show you the other one. But that one, I must mention the Brooklyn Bridge. We have, we get in a Brooklyn Bridge. We have to stop that. I, 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 I'm still, let me not say that because as I said, I need some explanation. I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's from. The prime minister's face, is on there and i don't be on both i don't believe that he would just have his face on something that is a fantasy and he don't know who did it and why it's done and it's all there in social media bearing his face but he has a portrait of him is on there i saw a comment from a long-standing cadbury member of the nbc referring to the other video and uh, she, she said, um, is there two Grenada? Because I guess the one she's living in, she has not seen any of this happening. I mean, I know they had up some crazy things. But I can't believe this actually came from this administration or people related to it friends, um, well-wishers, sympathizers. And if they, if they, if it's not directly related to the administration, then ask them to take it down. This is not Grenada. A tourist thing is a come, this is not the Grenada they're going to meet. This is not the Grenada they're going to meet. The Sutter's Bridge. The Tottenham Bridge had me. I, I mean, it is beautiful. Mwah. The airport uh, expansion project finishing in 2024, underground parking and all. The visitors' capacity doubling from 500,000 to a million a year. The multiplex. Um, cinema to be completed soon, and the others, as we see, I don't have to go through the Echo Village is another one to, to finish in 2024. The Gulf Coast Aquarium. Please message us in our comment section if you have an idea what this is about. I mean, we can tell AI is involved, but now. Kawana, this is something I wanted to talk to you about for a while now because there's something there. Since this new uh, administration came in, I've been saying to you, even before I started my own program, while I still was on the narrative, I said to you, keep your eye on Kawana. We were told in a press, in a press conference a while back, I can't keep up, I don't remember the date of that one, it was sometime last year, though, that the, the press conference was hosted by the Prime Minister, the, the, the Attorney General, and some others. I think it was um, Orlando Romain and Miss Crawford, because around that time they were going to name, they were going to launch the, um, the celebrations. Remember that thing with the celebrations? and October 19th launching together. And yeah, it was that press conference. They told us they had 
reacquired the land where the old flamboyant hotel was that was um that was given freehold freehold to the jewish gentleman mr warren newfield um let me say here that it's been years you know you're hearing about freehold it started with the property the radisson then grand beach property and you hear about freehold 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 i myself thought that freehold meant it was given free to these individuals. I was told and explained to that by a legal mind that freehold meant that they uh, uh, it was sold to them really and that they can do anything they want with it. That's where the freehold come in. You're free to do what because it's yours. You bought it. Prime property like that was not supposed to be sold. And I want to compliment this administration for, I applaud them for reacquiring our property, Grand Beach one or Radisson rather, and whichever other ones, the Kawana Bay, I applaud you for that. It belongs to us, it should stay with us. We have locals who have hotels on property on the beach and it doesn't belong to them, they're leasing it. And that is how it should continue. I really do uh, uh, applaud them for that. Speaking of the Radisson, things um, over the weekend, we had a little bit of fishy things happening there. We heard of something. It sounded fishy to me, I should say, but we'll speak about that later if time permits. So those lands should have never been sold, as I said. Anyway, at that press conference, we were also told that the government had also struck a deal with the Kawana Bay development who had the people and government of Grenada in court sued for 111 million US dollars, I think it was. And according to the attorney general, they struck a deal for 22 million US dollars total for reclaiming for the reclaiming the property and the settlement in court in the court by the way we the people were never told we were never told what we were being sued for not by the former administration nor by this administration we just going down the road merrily and and and, and you know telling us half truths and, and, and stuff like that let's hear what the attorney general had to say at that press conference just to clarify for the listening public that the state of Grenada was sued for $111 million thereabouts US in the Kewana Bay dispute. And we settled the dispute for 22 million, less than a quarter of what we were sued for. And in the, in the arbitration claim, there was not a claim in relation to the property as such, because the property was still owned by the True Blue developers. So in the settlement, we were able to get the property back for the people of Grenada and settle the arbitration dispute. So that encompassed the 22 million. Just, just so that people understand, the 22 million just did not only cover the value of the property. It was to settle all of the claims made against the people of Grenada or the state of Grenada um, that totaled $111 million. So I would say that was a good deal for us. We can't say it's a good deal if we don't know what we were being sued for and, and the, the different claims. This, she's speaking there, after the prime minister sitting in the same press conference with her, right next to her, made it quite clear that the 22 million was to Newfield and that there were private investors, some 214 of them, he didn't say the number. My investigation gave me that total. 214 of them that would have to be compensated separately. 
as the prime minister? Whatever money you made from an investment point of view is a risk that someone takes. If you, as a result of your investment, that's the matter between you and the developer, as a result of your investment, uh, the developer would have contracted and would have deeded you a condominium interest or a unit interest in the in the property, uh, then the acquisition would have acquired that. That's a property interest. Uh, and if any compensation is to be paid, it would be in relation to the property interest. Uh, but just like any other investment, if you take an investment, uh, let's, let's put it this way, whether or not the government acquired the property, uh, anyone who had up to or acquisition invested in that property, what would they have had? An interest in a abandoned, closed down site. Um, we can do an assessment of whether that's an investment or a loss. Um, but essentially, uh, what we've acquired is a property, and anyone who has an interest in the property would have a, an opportunity to present any claims uh, for evaluation of their interest in the property and to be compensated accordingly. So some people may decide you know, we're going to keep the investment we're staying in. That that's fine too, and they well, they continue to be. No, I'm saying they they can't decide whether they keep the investment. I'm saying the government has acquired the site. Mm -hmm. As a matter of law, uh, we have that right. And having acquired the site, I'm saying what they have is a right to be compensated for whatever interest they might have had in in, in, in the property. So I'm saying whatever investment, because I'm making the point that you could invest in something that doesn't actually have value. It's called a bad investment. Right, uh, you can buy something, you can spend a million dollars for it, and then uh, you try and sell it, and someone only wants to pay fifty dollars for it. So what I'm saying is that whatever interest um, any uh, investor has from a property interest perspective, uh, based on the Land Acquisition Act, uh, they would be entitled to the compensation. So, to date, we have no idea the total amount we have to pay out, and if in fact there was a deal because, as I said, we have 215, 214 investors to pay. The prime minister said so. You heard him say so twice. And next to him, Miss Lady come and she say, we get a deal for 22 million for everything. We know that Tawana Bay's local lawyer, Miss Daisy Andel, was given a space as director at the CBI board conflict of interest by this Deacon Mitchell and administration. And it's alleged that Mitchell and Co was the local agent or one of the local agent for the Kawana Bay development. Since there were, since we were told that the Kawana Bay was swapped for the uh, I should I say since then, I'm sorry, we were told that the Kawana Bay uh, was swapped for the Rivera property valued at $16 million and owned by Nagib Suwaris, the Silver Sand Egyptian billionaire, Rivera property plus $8,000 was swapped for Kawana Bay. The Rivera property is supposed to house Heroes Park. And uh, I thought, from what I understand, that we were going to have some semblance of Heroes Park for the celebration, the 50th, um, actually for the 7th of February, the, the exact date of, of our independence. And um, it was hinted out there that the bulk of the money for the celebration, that, that $22.5 million went towards Heroes Park. I'm not sure if it was to um, manure the bushes that's there in, in, in where Heroes Park is supposed to be. Let me use this opportunity to ask again some, for some transparency and accountability on how the money is located for that 50th anniversary celebration was spent. We are not going to let up. We are going to continue to ask Ms. Purcell, Mr. Orlando Romain, Ms. Wendy Crawford, please give us an update as to how the monies were set. Ms. Purcell said when they had the, the, the interview after the, the, the 7th of February that she didn't know it was a lot of um, a contracts. By now, you should sit down put it together and come to us, the people, and tell us how that $22.5 million was spent. 
So out of all that, a string of questions arises. One, has there been a full accounting of the project? And that's the Kawana Bay project thing. What is the settlement amount and how does that relate to the accounting? That's for the Kawana Bay. Who represented Grenada? Read the accounting. How will the agreement be paid and by who? When will work restart on the project? Because it seemed that everything was in order. When will work resume? Did the project owners contribute to the NDC in the last election campaign? We will continue, as I said, to ask these questions as long as we don't get answers. I said I would come back to you with the Radisson one time permit. So here it is. On the weekend, um, on Sunday, there was a breaking news that uh, a young lady was strangled and drowned in the resort pool. And, um, but, and the police was called in. Of course, you wait to hear what the police had to say. And um, it was noted, it was said that the day before the Saturday, that there were a lot of verbal fights between her and her partner. They were guests at the hotel. And um, the next day, the next morning, four day morning, as we would say, they went swimming at the pool. I guess the fights continued. That's what that was what was insinuated. So allegedly so. Um, then we we heard somewhere along the line that they were allegedly SGU students. Later on, I heard that the young man was an SGU student, allegedly, and his girlfriend was visiting from the US. All of that happened, and later on the evening, we had a release put out by the, um, the police. If you look on the screen there, you see the release. And I let me see if I can pull it up quickly and read to you what it said. The Royal Grenada Police Force. Um, well, let me, let me, let me, let me go. Go back, step back. Sunday, the 17th of March, 2024, press release, RGPF investigate death at the hotel in Grand and St. George, at a hotel in Grand and St. George. The Royal Grenada Police Force is currently investigating a possible drowning incident, which occurred on Sunday, the 17th of March at the hotel in St. George. At apparent approximately 5 10 a.m., members of the RGPF responded to reports of a drowning at the hotel in the south of the island. Primarily, primary preliminary reports suggest that the deceased went swimming in the hotel swimming pool when she encountered difficulties in the water. The deceased was retrieved from the swimming pool and CPR was, was administered, but she was unresponsive. She was subsequently announced dead by a medical doctor. The circumstances of the incident are still being investigated, so no further information can be shared at this time. Office of the Commission of, the, of Police, Community Contact, Community Relations, department, right? So as they said, the investigation is still ongoing. But the the part about um, she had difficulty in, difficulties in the water kind of got me a bit because um, it sounded like she was in the ocean and there was a current and the current puller or a big wave came and tossed her and that difficulty meant she probably had a heart attack and you know, so it, it's a bit, there's something a bit pitchy, something sounding uh, a, a little bit of a cover up, we sure yet, but let's wait to hear 
what the police had to say, have to say, because the Prime Minister say you don't speak until the investigation is over. I apologize, I should not have spoken, but I just thought that, you know, as I mentioned, Ronison, it all came back to me and it was announced as breaking news. It was out there, not just in social media, but by, by media personnel who normally give breaking news and uh, as to what is happening in Grenada, because sometimes we don't even get it from the mainstream media, right? So um, I put up the release, you can read it, you can dissect it, there's not much to dissect. Um, the drowning occurred approximately 5.10, um, no international standard hours for using a pool at a hotel or resort. It's open daily from 800 hours, which is 8 a.m. to 2100 hours, which is 9 p.m. So if the individual was at the pool at 5 a.m., because they said the police said they got their message at 10 past 5, where was the security? Why was she allowed or they allowed? No, you're not hearing anything about they, you're just hearing about the young lady. Why was she allowed to use the pool or to remain in the pool, even though she got up and he said, I'm going to take a swim? Um, why wasn't she one? Because you could one. You can pick her up and drag her to the pool, but you can one. I don't know if she was one. I'm asking the question: Was she one? Was you know what what happened there? Um, this is preliminary report suggested by the the um, the police. The deceased went swimming in the hotel pool when she encountered difficulties in the water. What happened to? The, um, the the breaking news that her and her partner was in the pool, we don't know yet. And um, who retrieved her from the pool? You know, there are a lot of questions and, and answered and answered on <laughs> questions that, um, you know, we, we always left with. We always left with a bag of unanswered questions. And, um, I know they say, oh, well, with all that's going on here in Grenada, we don't have to speak about it. But um, there are families involved. It's a young lady, apparently early 20s. So why her 21? I'm not sure. So um, she has family. She's supposed to, you know. And, and so if it was my child, I would like to know what's going on, you know. Um, just seems like they're more in the matter besides the pestle. Yeah, just seems like there are more in the matter besides the, the folks. This is a wrap on today's episode of Simon Says. As usual, it was wonderful conversing with you, keeping them honest. Thank you for viewing Simon Says, where facts come first. See you next week, same time, same place. Have a great week. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode.